Hi there, everyone. I'm so delighted to have you join me. And I want to give a big, big thank you to IPEN for asking me to be a keynote at their Wellbeing and Education virtual conference. Today, we're going to look at a new framework. Well, reasonably new. It's been around for the last seven years. It's called the SEARCH framework. And it's a framework that I have been developing through a range of different research techniques over a period of time. What I'm going to do today is, is introduce you to the framework. I'm going to show you how it is that you can utilize that framework to kind of pull together all of your various positive education programs and practices and initiatives and allow, allow them to come into your school in a more consistent, more cohesive way. If you're a scientist, I'll show you how it is that I have developed this framework and maybe how you can think about using this framework to uh, develop some of your own research questions. And after we've had a look at sort of the applied way of using this framework, how you can use it as an auditing tool, how you can use it to identify gaps for professional development, how you can use it to create a scope and sequence in your school, I'm going to finish with some hot off the press uh, research, some research that I've recently been conducting looking at the application of the search pathways in the way in which students are coping with COVID and also the way in which teachers are coping with COVID. So let's get started. It's such an exciting time to be part of the field of positive education, and it is a, a vastly growing field. You can see on this quote here by Shanklin and Rossett back in 2017 that uh, they called for the idea that the application of positive psychology interventions in schools is a fast developing research area. And for any of you who have been in the field for um, any number of years, I've been in the field for 27 years, you will notice how, how the rapid rate of growth really over the last 10 years. And it's been a very, very exciting field to be a part of. Before I go into the field, I do want to pay homage to the sort of forerunners, some very, very important well-being in education movements that have actually been around for decades, way back since the 1990s, and really are um, now woven into the fabric of positive education, but, but we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so I want to recognise that resilience education has been around since the 1990s, and indeed, you know, many people who are watching this will know the Penn Resilience Program, and that was the mid-90s that that was first developed. The field of social emotional learning has also been around since the 90s, and a lot of great work has been done in the social and emotional learning movement. We've also got values education, which is a field that's been around for many decades as well. So if we think about where we, where we started from and where we are now, we can see that those three early fields really helped to shape for a couple of decades at least shape the new evolutions of positive education that came forward. So for example, with character education or values education, um, then that spawned the field of character education, which is really alive and vibrant at the moment, and likewise helped to evolve the field of strength-based education. If you take the social and emotional learning movement, that, that really was the, the forerunner, and, it, and it's still doing a lot of great work now, um, the forerunner to emotional intelligence. And there's a lot of work now, research and programs now, teaching students how to develop their own emotional intelligence. And social and emotional learning has also kind of spun out with a range of different uh, research and programs on how it is that we teach young people social skills and pro-social skills and help seeking. If we take resilience, the movement of resilience in the, in the 2000s, that also led to a very large research body on coping and how it is that students can cope more effectively with their demands of everyday life. So we do, we, we have seen a sort of logical progression over the last three decades of growth in the field. But as I said to you before, it's very fair to say that really in the last 10 years, and if you think back to Professor Martin Seligman's inaugural positive education journal article, which was in 2009. So from sort of 2010 onwards, there really has been a proliferation of research and programs. And so we've gone from these uh, set in the middle to things like mindfulness, growth mindset, flow. We've gone to research programs on empathy, gratitude, grit, uh, kindness, random acts of kindness and rack schools, 
We've also looked at self-compassion. We've looked at active constructive responding. We've looked at high quality connections. We've looked at the broaden and build theory. We've looked at goal setting. We've looked at forgiveness. We've looked at meaning. We've looked at boredom. That's, a, that's one of the newer topics that's coming through and how we can address it with uh, through engagement. We've looked at best possible self and so on. Ha. Time for me to take a breath um, because there are so many new initiatives, programs, constructs, research topics that are coming forward. In fact, uh, Jeffrey Fro and his colleagues in 2011 conducted a review paper of the field of school psychology, a related field to positive education, and found that there were 449 constructs that were being tested by researchers out there. So it is, it's a growing field and it is a vast field. And, and that in and of itself is really, really exciting. It means we've got lots of different opportunities. And if you're, if you're a teacher watching this, you've got so many different opportunities of things to bring into your students. But I think what I've seen with the growth of the field is a little bit of a fragmentation and it does raise the question for us, and particularly if you're working in a school, and this is a question I get for, from so many schools all across the world over the last 10 years is, you know, how do I choose? Do, do I do mindfulness or mindset? Do I do grit or gratitude? You know, do I do um, meaning or do I do forgiveness? And it, it is a really difficult question for you. How do you choose amongst this beautiful menu of a growing evidence-based field? And the, the answer that I give to schools when they ask me that question is, is firstly, just step back. It's very easy to kind of feel like you're overwhelmed with all of these different choices. And, and even within, within each of those different areas, you know, within social skills, there's hundreds of different programs. How do I know which program to choose within that? So step back and have a look at the bigger picture. Particularly, my advice to schools is first and foremost, what is the mission of your school? Think about all of those different constructs and whether you want to do mindfulness or mindset, whether you want to be a random acts of kindness school, whether you want to focus on empathy, whether you want to focus on flow or engagement. Think back to and step back and have a look at well, what is my school's mission and align your positive education initiatives with your mission. Have a think too also from the bigger picture about professional development. Where are areas of your staff who have already been developed in certain initiatives? Do a gap analysis. So what are we currently doing around positive education and what's missing? And then finally have a look at scope and sequence because there are different developmental needs and maybe you want to focus on relationships with the younger kids and coping skills with the senior school students. So how do we step back and have a look at the bigger picture so we can capitalise on aligning the, our positive education choices with our mission with our professional development, we can do that gap analysis, we can map it onto a scope and sequence. And I think, and my experience has been um, in this field for many, many years now, that the easiest, the most effective, and uh, the most successful way of doing that is to work with a framework. So framework gives us many different uh, benefits. This, what you see here is a visual of um, some beautiful guidelines that Professor Martin Seligman published in a 2018 journal in article in the Journal of Positive Psychology. And he said, when you're looking for a framework, you want to make sure that it has these six qualities. Firstly, you want to make sure that it's parsimonious. And what he means by that is that um, it's containable, that it, that it contains the smallest number of well-being building blocks without reducing um, the capacity for well-being. So you don't want to be overwhelmed. You don't want a framework that has you know, 110 different pathways to well-being. Secondly, make sure that each element, each building block has clear criteria, that they're independent, related, but independent of each other, that each element of your framework is something that a student will want to do. A student will want to develop their strengths. They'll want to show forgiveness. They'll want to be in flow because it feels good. It's intrinsically motivating for them. And finally, he says, when you are developing a framework for the building blocks of well-being for your students, you need to make sure that those elements do can, in fact, lead to programs, practices, interventions at school. Now, when we think about positive education for frameworks, there are two kind of broad approaches to developing a framework. The first is, well, I'm just going through these six pathways. The first is a theory-driven framework. Theory-driven frameworks are wonderful. They're top-down and they start with a theory or an idea. 
Um, in contrast, the second way of developing a framework is a data-driven framework. A data-driven framework is bottom up. Probably the most um, popular theory-driven framework that we're all familiar with is Professor Martin Seligman's PERMA framework. I, the framework that I'm about to show you, I opted for a different approach and I decided to use a data-driven approach to develop this framework. And that's really just my own preference. I'm a bit of a science geek and I like data. And um, as much as I like theories and ideas, I guess I'm more of a pragmatist and I wanted to go in and say, well, you know, what, what actually happens on the ground? What does the science tell us is contributing to the well-being of a young person? So what I'm about to show you now is the development of my search framework and uh, how it is that I use the science and the data to bring us to a new framework for positive education. Very quickly, I'm not going to go into the science too much, but I have since 2013 have conducted a range of different studies that have helped to develop the search framework. In 2013, we started with a large bibliometric analysis of 1.3 million peer-reviewed psychology journal articles. This was with one of my PhD students, Ruben Rusk, and that started to give us an insight into what are the factors that contribute to wellbeing, not just for young people, but for adults as well. In 2015, we published a cluster analysis paper in the Journal of Positive Psychology that pulled out the key pathways that lead to wellbeing. That led, once I had those pathways in mind, that led to a different type of data analysis where I conducted action research with 10 schools. And that was published in 2017 in a book called Wellbeing and Recovery. In 2019, once I had the six elements of the search framework that had come from the cluster analysis and the, and the bibliometric analysis, so 17,000 peer-reviewed psychology studies that have conducted science on what contributes to well-being, and then taking the findings from that, condensing that into six pathways, taking it out to schools and asking the schools themselves, asking the students, asking the teachers, asking the school board, asking the parents, did these six pathways make sense to you? Once we had established that, I published a paper last year with a colleague of mine, Dr. Daniel Lawton, where we went and had a look at the six search pathways, and I'll explain a little bit more to you in a moment of those to see are there existing interventions out there? And yes, there are. We were able to find 75 peer-reviewed studies from 14 different countries across the world that have developed interventions that specifically map onto each of the six search pathways. Now, I'll put a little footnote here to say these are 75 interventions that have been evaluated by scientists. Of course, there are many, many, there are hundreds of interventions and, and practices and programs out there that would slot along the search framework. I, because of my role as a scientist, really only wanted to look at those particular programs and interventions that had been evaluated through the peer review process. And now I'm up to testing search in a range of different survey research. And I'm, as I said, I'm going to show you some of the latest research that I'm doing right now during COVID times. So search, I've mentioned it a number of times now, and I know quite a lot of you are familiar with it, and it stands for the following acronym. So what we found through the last seven years of those different ways of conducting research was that there are six key pathways that are building blocks based on scientific evidence for the well-being of both students and adults. And we have our strengths, emotional management, attention and awareness, relationships, coping, habits and goals. So many of these you'll be familiar with and you will have seen them in other uh, models. And for me, what, what makes me confident about these pathways is because it came from such a rigorous data-driven process. When you take each of the first letters of the six pathways, you come up with the acronym of SEARCH. And I love this acronym because, especially with young people, it's really about messaging to young people that you can't take your mental health for granted. Um, you need to work on developing your mental health. You need to search for your mental health. You need to engage in effort. You need to engage in activities and exercises and programs and practices just in the same way that you tell a young person if they want to become physically fit, they need to put in effort. They need to engage in regular exercise and activity. It's the same for their mental fitness. They can't take it for granted. They need to work on it. And I love the idea of telling them you need to search for your own well-being. You need to be proactive around this. So the search framework, let's have a look at it very quickly against Professor Seligman's criteria for developing a framework. First of all, parsimony. We have parsimony here. We've got six, uh, six pathways. So 
not too overwhelming. We've got clear criteria and the benefit of using decades of science to develop the search framework is that we we do have clear criteria. We know what strengths are. We know what emotional management are because they came from the science and the literature itself. We've got our six independent but related pathways. Each of these pathways is intrinsically rewarding. It's intrinsically rewarding for a young person to use their strengths. It's calming when a young person develops skills that help them around their attempt, building up their attentional and their awareness uh, muscle. And as I mentioned, each of these pathways leads to interventions, at least 75 interventions that have been published in and scientifically evaluated in the peer review literature. So let's go back to our initial puzzle of the, just the raft of different things, topics, skill sets that we can bring in for our students. And let's then take this and put it into our search framework. So the first thing that I've done with search after developing it is help schools to use it as an organizing, an organizing tool. And you can use this as an organizing tool. Search is free. It's been published in the peer review uh, literature. It's out in the public domain. So there's no cost attached to search. Please use it. Take the, the current pathways that you have and organize them. The second thing that you can do is use it to audit. What are you currently doing? And does it truly hit the broad spectrum of the building blocks of well-being that the evidence shows we need for our young people? So when I go in and work with schools, for example, they may have a couple of programs, but when we overlay search as the audit tool, what they realise is actually both of our programs are sitting in coping and we're not doing anything around strengths. We're not doing anything around attention and awareness. Or I might have a school that's got three programs and they've got a really, really big push on relationships. And that's fantastic. But what the science says is relationships in and of themselves are just one building block. They're not enough. You might be working at a school that um, has a big push on mindfulness, for an example. And I love mindfulness. I'm a huge fan of it. But mindfulness in and of itself is not enough. So what we're trying to do with the search framework then is encourage you to have a look at what are we doing? What are all the initiatives, practices and programs that we've got? How can we uh, more strategically choose where we spend our money to make sure that we've got initiatives and programs and we're training our teachers with professional development along each of those six pathways? Another thing that you can do with the search framework is develop a scope and sequence. And so it may be, depending on your context, that you really want to focus on strengths and emotional management for students in junior high and when they get up to their middle school years, it's about really helping them to pay better attention and be a little bit more mindful and really cultivate those relationships. And perhaps when you get up to senior school, it's more around teaching them the coping skills and the habits and goals they're going to need to be academically successful and have a high level of well-being during pressured years. And of course, in the elementary years too, you might have different year levels where you focus on different pathways. So search is a deeply, deeply data-driven framework that you can use as an organizing, an organizing tool, you can use it as an audit, you can use it to align with your school's vision and mission statements, and you can use it for a scope and sequence. Right, so let's finish off our talk today uh, by moving forward and having a look at some hot off the press research on whether search makes a difference to the well-being of students and teachers during COVID. So we know that search promotes well-being because we've got so many, uh, all of the research articles that I talked to you about before, 17,000 studies saying that these are the key pathways to well-being. We don't know if search makes a difference during tough times. And so as COVID has come along, I've been able to uh, mobilise a couple of research teams to have a look at the degree to which search does or does not influence well-being during COVID times. Really what I focused on was this idea of adversarial growth. And you can see here the definition by Cassidy and colleagues that adversarial growth is the process of deriving positive growth from adversity. You, might have all, you may have also heard of constructs like post-traumatic growth or benefit finding or stress-related growth, and they're all kind of related uh, constructs. I wanted to focus on adversity for young people because we know that COVID is an adversity. We don't necessarily know it's a trauma. Um, and we, you will have experienced this in your own school. Some students did quite well and are doing quite well during COVID and enjoyed remote learning, some not so well. So we're focusing on 
those students who are going through adversity, can they grow as a result of this? This is a uh, study that I'm conducting with uh, two of two colleagues of mine, Dr. Kelly Allen, who's at Monash University in Australia, and Assistant Professor Gokum Arslan, who's at Mehmet um, Arslan Akoy University in Turkey. And I'm so sorry, I know I, I mispronounced that, but I did my best. <laughs> so we have uh, conducted a research study. We've gone in and we've asked the students through survey to measure the degree of search they were experiencing prior to COVID. So we asked them, think back before COVID, to what degree was your school teaching you about how to use your strengths, how to understand and manage your emotions, how to calm yourself down when you're feeling stressed, how to foster positive relationships, cope with challenges and setbacks, and create healthy habits and grow goals. So you can see each of the six elements of the search pathways in that survey. Then the particular group that sample that we measured were students who had returned to school after a period of remote learning. So once they had returned to school, we uh, administered a survey that looked at adversarial growth. So this is a well-known survey. And to give you an idea of what we asked the students, think about whether your experience with COVID-19 has changed you in any of the following ways. And you can see a couple of sample items here. I've learned how to deal with uncertainty better. Um, I've learned not to let the small things bother me so much. I found out I was stronger than I thought and I became more accepting of others. There are eight items in this survey, but that gives you a sense of uh, what we were trying to measure. And we were trying to look at if the student felt the school had equipped them with skill sets around search before COVID, did that did that increase their chance of growing as a result of going through adversity? This is what we found. Yes, it did. There was a significant impact on student growth on return to school if the, based on the degree to which they felt they'd been taught the search pathways prior to COVID. In fact, 21% of adversarial growth was predicted and 21% is a big slice of the pie. If I was able to tell you as a teacher pre-COVID, hey guys, COVID is coming along um, there's something that you can do that will increase your the likelihood of your students growing through this global crisis by 21%. That's a big slice of the pie. If you think about it from an, from an academics perspective, 21% is more than two grades better. So significant improvement. What we also found and what we also tested was we asked the students during your experience of remote learning, to what degree did you, and we asked them questions around the, their capacity for emotional processing the, the way their cognitive reframing of the situation and whether they were able to utilize their strengths during remote learning. And we put this into the model too. We wanted to test does, did search, did knowing about the skill sets in search before COVID hit increase the chance of a student engaging in emotional processing during remote learning, positive reframing and using their strengths? And it did. Significant improvements. What we found was that Search significantly predicts the way in which students feel, the way in which students think, and the way in which students acted during remote learning. It significantly predicted their emotional processing, the way they feel, significantly predicted positive framing, the way they think, and it significantly predicted their strengths use, the way they act. What we also found when we added those three elements into the structural equation model is that student growth bumped up from 21% of predicted explained variance to 56%. So again, that's a very, very big slice of the pie. And what it shows us is that the more that we can engage in initiatives, practices, programs that build up the skill set of young people, the better chance they have of growing, not only bouncing back from world crisis and, and adversity, but bouncing forward, actually growing and changing in a positive way as a result. Then we did another thing. We got a bit tricky here and we threw in uh, academic growth, particularly the academic motivation of the students. We used a well-known survey around academic motivation and we asked the students, now that you're back at school, to what degree are you academically motivated? And we put that into the structural equation model and what we found is when we put that into the structural equation model, student growth went up just a little, just by 1%. So students who return to school and feel academically motivated, that's a contributing factor to them also feeling this sense of growth through adversity. 
And we found that search and the three processes, how they felt, thought and acted during remote learning were significant predictors of academic motivation. Again, 14%. So you may be looking at it thinking, well, that's not very much. In psychology terms, 14% is a really, really big percentage. And again, if I go back to that idea of saying to you pre-COVID, hey, we know COVID's coming. I've got a magic wand. If there was something that I could get you to do now that would predict and help contribute to a student's academic motivation, having been remote learning and coming back to school, I'm sure that you would take that opportunity. We didn't just look at search and the, the relationship between search and adversarial growth in students. We've also looked at it with teachers. And this is an ongoing study now with one of my PhD students, Sharon Garrow, and um, her two primary supervisors, Dr. Stephen Fison and Dr. Catherine Harrell, who are based at Alpha Crucius College in Sydney and myself uh, at the University of Melbourne in Melbourne. We have conducted a study. We've reached out um, and uh, had 270, or actually I think it's 280, teachers from all across the world contribute uh, to this survey. You can see here the biggest countries are Australia, which makes sense because the four researchers are Australian-based. We've also got a lot of teachers from New Zealand who've done this survey, Hong Kong, the United States, Canada. Um, by the way, if you're interested in participating in this survey and you're a teacher, the survey is still open and I'll give you a little bit of information about that in a minute. You can see lots of different countries here. We've got teachers from Poland and Ireland and Germany and Spain and Russia and Malaysia. We've got teachers from Argentina and Nigeria. So a global study. And uh, again, looking at that idea of um, search. In particular, we asked the teachers right now in the midst of COVID, to what degree are you using any of the following strategies to help maintain your own mental health? We asked them, to what degree are you engaging and using your character strengths? To what degree are you focusing on your emotions, paying focused attention, and so on? Then we've asked them, to what degree do you feel that COVID has changed you? Has it changed your priorities in life? Has it given you a greater appreciation of the value of your own life? Have you felt closer to others? And do you have a better sense of being handle, able to handle difficulties now? This is the uh, post-traumatic growth survey, well-known survey. Where we're at with this particular study is we haven't done our structural equation modeling yet because we haven't got a full sample. So I'm just gonna show you a little snapshot of what we've found so far with those 280 teachers. In terms of the use of strategies around strengths, this is what we find. What I'm going to show you now are the percentages of teachers who said, I was using these strategies frequently or a lot. So 29% of teachers using their strengths frequently or a lot. 28% managing their emotions. 36% paying focused attention, engaging in mindfulness and being aware of themselves and others. 44% focusing on their relationships, drawing support from others during COVID. And that's something that we would predict and expect. 51% of teachers using techniques to help them cope, like walking and praying and so on. And 53% of teachers said, I'm really focusing on setting healthy habits and having goals during this time. So the first thing that jumps out to me is these are not high percentages. These are percentages of the teachers who said, I'm doing this frequently or a lot. And what we see is, you know, more than half of the teachers aren't engaging in these six pathways that lead to mental health. So it says something about how it is that we can engage in professional development to better help teachers manage and support their mental health. Let's have a look at now one more um, research study before I pass, I finish today's talk. And this is Again, this set of teachers, and we looked at the measure of post-traumatic growth, which is a scale that goes from zero up to 60. We divided the sample based on whether the teachers had been engaged in remote learning for six weeks or less versus those teachers across the world who've been in remote learning for seven weeks or more, because obviously how long you're in remote learning is going to have a big impact on your mental health and your capacity to cope. We then divided the teachers into those who were demonstrating a low use of the search strategies and those who are demonstrating a high use of the search strategies. And this is what we found. For teachers who'd been in remote learning for six weeks or less, not a huge amount of difference in post-traumatic growth. Those who were low use of strategies were just below the midline. They, were, they scored 29. So they were, they were just below halfway in terms of post-traumatic growth. 
Those who had high, high search strategies were at 31. They're a little bit above. So search doesn't seem to make a big difference initially. But what we did find is for those teachers who'd been in remote learning for a long period of time, this is where the use of search started to take an impact. And what you see here is really not much shift from 29 to uh, 31, the teachers who weren't really using their search strategies. The teachers who were using their search strategies as as COVID went on and remote learning went on, it made a big difference to their post-traumatic growth. We saw a 3% change over time with the low search strategy group, but a 10% change in growth for those teachers who were using their search strategies. So I wish I could tell you a little bit more, but we are in the process of still participating or still conducting this study. So if you are a teacher, please, please, please participate. Um, the cutoff date for this will be the end of November and you have the details here to get onto the Survey Monkey. It's a 15 minute question questionnaire and we'd love to find out from you about your levels of search and stress and well-being and post-traumatic growth. Okay, so I'm bringing up to my conclusions here now and my conclusions are that, you know, positive education, it's, su it's such an exciting field. It's growing, it's proliferating, but that can mean that it's a little bit confusing and a little bit fragmented. If you're finding that, then my suggestion to you is a key way of helping to make your approach consistent and cohesive and aligned to your missions is to use a framework. Frameworks help you to be systematic. There are many different frameworks out there. Obviously, I like my own search framework and I've been using it with hundreds of schools now all across the world to great effect. It is an evidence-based and data-driven framework. It's free. It's freely available. So please feel free to use it if you think it'll help. And what we are finding is that it not only does it help well-being during the good times, but the research we've recently collected shows that search is a critical factor in helping both students and teachers to grow through these times. So again, thank you so much to IPEN for having me as a keynote. I'm wishing you all the best during these very strange times and I hope you really enjoy the conference. Thanks. See you later.